Thank you very much for the introduction. Also many thanks to the organizers. This is really a very nice place and great workshop and I'm very happy that I could be here. So what I would like to present to you today, this is a work that we put on archive together with Massimiliano just a few weeks ago. And we were interested, originally at least, in elliptic phi4 models on the full space. So these are singular SPDEs. They become rather delicate because we perturb them by some space white noise. And we develop a theory which covers existence for these elliptic models. And when we were working on that, we actually realized that the same method, the same decompositions and the same a priori estimates apply to the parabolic situation as well. So I will also tell you something about uh, the parabolic equations and what we can prove there. Okay. But let me be more precise. So we are interested in these two very simply and innocent looking equations. Uh, the first one is an elliptic semi-linear SPDE. Uh, phi is a solution, mu is a mass, so this is a constant. And it is important for the elliptic equations that this is positive. Um, we see this cubic term on the left hand side and on the right hand side we have our irregular perturbation. You should think of a space white noise. So this is a random distribution. It depends on X and it's very irregular. Uh, and we will see in the sequel how irregular it is depending on the dimension. And the relevant dimensions, or actually the dimensions that we can solve this equation in, are d equal 4 and 5. And this is again linked to the irregularity of the white noise. Okay, and on the other hand, we would like to consider a parabolic version of this equation. So now phi, uh, the solution, is a function or distribution actually, which depends on time and space. We have the uh, elliptic operator here, and we have again a cubic term on the left hand side. And now our perturbation on the right hand side is a space time white noise. Yeah, so this would be an uh, again, a random distribution, but it depends on time and space. And it is irregular in both variables. And uh, we will see in a second how this irregularity actually behaves depending on dimension. And in particular, we will see that somehow uh, the time here counts for two. And so you will then see what is uh, the interesting dimension here, or the dimension that we could consider, namely d equal 2 and 3. Yeah, and somehow the connection between these dimensions is that uh, the regularity of space white noise in dimension 4, for instance, is the same as the regularity of space time white noise in dimension 2. Yeah, so in this sense, d equal 4 and d equal 2 here have about the same level of difficulty. And the same holds true for d equal 5 and d equal 3 here. And these are very interesting equations that are connected to some interesting conjectures uh, from quantum field theory. Um, namely, these are both connected to the construction of the Euclidean quantum field theory. And this is a measure which is formally given by this formula. Uh, and it is conjectured, or well, uh, the parabolic equation on Rd is linked to this measure via parisi stochastic quantization. So actually, the measure should be obtained as an invariant measure for this parabolic equation. Uh, but on the other hand, the elliptic equation is also linked to the phi4 quantum field theory. Namely, if you study the elliptic equation on Rd, this should now be linked to the phi 4 d minus 2 quantum field theory. So you see again somehow this connection between the different dimensions. So if I have here dimension 2 is the same as if I have here dimension 4. Yeah? And this is the so-called Parisi-Surlas dimensional reduction. Uh, this was published in Physical Review Letters and there, uh, there are already some partially rigorous results by Klein and co-authors. 
And it's basically a computation which tells you that if you have a solution for this elliptic model on RD and you fix two coordinates, that means you look at your solution on a D minus two dimensional hyperplane and the law of this solution uh, should be the quantum field theory measure. So we were originally motivated uh, by, by this conjecture and as a first step towards proving that, well, we asked ourselves, do solutions to these elliptic equations even exist? Okay, but let me be a little bit more precise about the irregularity of these equations. So here I have them again, this is the elliptic equation and we want to study it in d equal four and five and the parabolic one for d equal two and three. Okay, and now the important question is what is the regularity of the right hand side? Because that of course influences the regularity you could obtain for your solution. And you could show that if psi is a space white noise on RD, then locally, this is a random distribution which belongs to this negative Bessel space. And so you see that the dimension depends, uh, sorry, uh, the regularity depends on the dimension. And it, it is a negative distribution. Okay, and I have already said how it looks like for the space-time white noise. So here, uh, we obtain d plus two over two. Now what I said that time counts for two. Okay, and now this is an elliptic and a parabolic equation. So for them we have the Schauder estimates. Now this helps you to somehow determine what regularity do you actually expect from your solution. And these Schauder estimates, they tell you that you gain two degrees of regularity. So for the elliptic equation, if we are in d equal four, or for the parabolic in d equal two, the white noise would have such a regularity, so basically minus two minus kappa, where kappa is positive, small but positive. Um, and so then we gain two derivatives for the solution. Yeah. Okay, and for the five dimensional elliptic case, this becomes even worse. So the regularity here is worse, it is minus five over two, and then we gain two derivatives, but still the solution would be a negative distribution, and even, of course, more negative than in the four-dimensional case. Okay, and so now let us go back to the equations. Well, that's nice that we can somehow expect this regularity, but can we actually define all the terms? And somehow that's the problem in singular SPDEs, that due to this irregularity, they are not well posed analytically. Yeah, so you need to do something, and the problematic term is the cube. Yeah, because while we teach our students in some basic courses that you cannot just multiply distributions, but yeah, there are then people also here in the audience who tell us, wait a moment, you can multiply distributions, but you need to do it in the smart way. And this is also what we need to do here. So actually what we teach our students about multiplications, if you have two distributions in these Bessel spaces, well, you can multiply them. Uh, so that means the product is well-defined analytically if the sum of the two regularities is positive. Oh. And so now I can go back to the regularity that I expect from my solution, and you see that this is, of course, not satisfied. I cannot multiply phi with phi. Okay, and that means that I need to do something else. Uh, so there, there is some non-trivial argument that I need to perform. And here this is called renormalization. So somehow it means if you, for instance, mollify the noise, you replace xi, your distribution, by its mollification, which is smooth. And now you can solve the equation, right? And you would like to pass to the limit, get rid of the mollification. And somehow what this rule of thumb tells you is that there must be something diverging. Yeah? Otherwise, the product would be well-defined. So there is something diverging, and to actually solve the equation, you need to get rid of this divergence. In other words, you need to subtract an infinity. Now, this is the renormalization, and you could also think about it uh, the following way. Actually, there is this mass, the constant mu, which I somehow 
chose, right? Or somebody gave it to me. So what this tells you is that this is not the physical constant. You need to somehow replace it by mu minus infinity to describe some real world situation. And so this is also what we are gonna do. Okay, so in the, in the late years, um, these singular SPDEs created a lot of excitement, especially in this community. So I'm actually very happy that most of the people from this list are here in the audience. Um, and there is also many results connected to this Phi 4 model. I have chosen only those that are uh, really very much related to what I'm going to present in the sequence. Um, the first results concerned these equations on the finite volume. That means on uh, the dimensional torus, so periodic boundary conditions. And they also concerned local solutions in time. So usually the first methods, um, they solve the equations using Banach fixed point. And there you usually need a small time. Okay, let me maybe say already here that there is really a big difference between the finite volume and the infinite volume. And the reason for that is that the noise grows at infinity. So you need weights to control it somehow. And this brings many difficulties in solving the equations, getting the estimates, and somehow in all the arguments you have to take care of these weights. And in particular, you need to take care of the fact that whenever you put a weight to a product, you actually lose a weight because both of the functions or distributions, they need part of this weight. And so then you need some argument to put you back on track so that you're able to close the arguments. Okay, so the first result here was by the Prato de Biche in two space dimensions. So this is the easier dimension. And they proved existence of local in time solutions on the torus. And then for a long time, the three dimensional case remained open. And the big breakthrough came with the theory of regularity structures by Martin Heider. So he used this theory to prove existence, uniqueness, actually local well posedness of solutions up to some random stopping time. And this result was then reformulated by Katelier Chuk, who used the theory of paracontrolled distributions. But again, this concerns only local in time solutions. And then another big step was given uh, by Mura Weber, who proved existence of global solutions. And actually, they prove even more. They prove a very interesting property, which is the so-called coming down from infinity property. And so what this tells you, and this is really due to the particular structure of this equation, in particular due to the cubic term, it tells you, uh, actually, everything is written in this estimate. So here they estimate the solution in some negative Bessel space, B minus one half, and they get an estimate which is uniform in the initial condition. So in other words, no matter how far away you start, right, somehow at infinity, your, your, your solution comes very quickly to some compact set. And so this is really a very strong property, and the speed in which it comes again to the origin um, is square root of t. And this comes from the cubic term. Okay, and so what uh, was used in their argument, this is a very nice paper and they use uh, Bessel spaces and they somehow make use of the whole scale BPQ or at least BP infinity, if I'm not wrong. And so how to do that? I said that the key point which helps you with this result is the cubic term. You need to use it. Yeah? So it's like um, you need to go back to the classical PDE theory and maybe recall some basic energy estimates because this is how it would be done in the classical PDE theory. And so what they do in this paper, uh, they test by a very large power, power of the solution. So that's like doing LP energy estimates. And then from the cubic term, because this gives you a good term on the left-hand side of your estimates, you can use it to absorb some terms from the right-hand side. So this is uh, what they did in this paper. And they have uh, one more paper, which in dimension two proves uh, global well -posedness. So now I mean global also with respect to the space variable. Um, 
And the proof proceeds as follows. They start with local solutions on a large torus. So basically, that's the result of the Prato de Buch. Yeah. And then they develop new a priori estimates, which are uniform in two aspects. First of all, they are somehow uniform global in time, which allows to prove them, uh, allows them to prove global solutions in time on this large torus. But these a priori estimates, they are also uniform in the size of the torus, and therefore they are able to pass to the limit with the size of the torus. Yeah, and in the end, they obtain global solutions on the whole R2. Okay, and here is uh, what we did. So as I said, originally we were interested in the elliptic equations. For those, we were able to prove existence. Actually, uniqueness for elliptic equations is somehow not so simple. Yeah? I also told you that the mass, this constant for elliptic equations should be positive. And somehow one would expect uniqueness maybe for a large mass at least. But what does the large mean, right? Here it seems like it would be omega dependent. It would depend on the noise. Mm -hmm. Or maybe one could do some probabilistic kind of uniqueness on a large set or something like that. For the parabolic model, things become easier. So we could prove existence, also uniqueness, and also uh, the coming down from infinity. And our ideas are the following. We actually wanted to stay in the B infinity infinity scale. The reason for that is somehow it's simpler. Already if you think about the para product estimates and you need to worry about BPQ spaces, well, you need to be careful. But if you do everything in the infinity infinity scale, these things become simpler. And so uh, in order to be able to do that, we introduce a new localization technique. Now you remember we deal with distribution. So, so our solution is a distribution. And this localization technique does the following thing. Um, we could split a distribution into two parts. One is irregular. Um, but it behaves nicely at infinity. Namely, it doesn't need any weights, or maybe it could even absorb some growing weights at infinity. Hmm. On the other hand, the regular part, so that's the second component, this possibly grows at infinity, so we need the weights to somehow push it down. Hmm. And well, in the end, I will show you, we do this also in order to decompose our equation. And we end up with an equation which is irregular, but we don't have problems with the weights. And the equation is linear. And therefore, we can somehow decouple these two equations and somehow use some irregular methods for the first equation, but we don't have problems with the weights. And then for the regular part, we have an equation uh, which needs weights, but it also has this magical cubic term, which helps you deal with the weights. And um, the regular part is actually so nice that it gives classical solutions, and therefore we may use pointwise maximum principle. And therefore, we are able to stay in the infinity infinity scale, and somehow the method simplifies. Okay, so let me be more precise. Uh, what weighted best of spaces do we use, and what are actually these localizers? So, if you think about it, we have distributions, and I said I want to split a distribution as a sum of two components. One is irregular, one is regular. Okay, there was this additional thing with the weights, but maybe for the moment we can forget that. And so if you just have this goal, split it into irregular and regular part, well, you can do that very easily if you are on the torus, for instance. Well, you just cut your uh, sum of little wood paley blocks. Yeah? And then uh, the finite sum is regular, the rest would be the irregular part. Yeah? But now in addition, we have these weights. And we want to also play with the weights. And that means we need to somehow trace the behavior of the weight, how it changes in the real space. And in order to do that, uh, we use a smooth dyadic partition of unity, WK, and we define the irregular part as follows. 
So we do exactly this cutting of, of the um, sum of Littlewood Paley blocks. This is what you see here. So here we take the large blocks, but the constant LK, that means the point where I cut my sum, depends on where I am in the real space, depends on this partition of unity. So this is for the irregular part. And for the regular, well, I choose the, uh, the small Littlewood Paley blocks. And again, there is a constant LK, which is really where I cut the sum. And this depends on uh, the point where I am somehow in the real space. Okay, and so for these equations, it is enough to work with polynomial weights. So from now on, rho will always be a polynomial weight. But uh, you see nu is bigger or equal than zero. That means I only consider weights that are decaying at infinity. Oh. Okay, and the best of spaces that we use are given by this norm. So it's like the usual best of spaces, but here the little Paley blocks are multiplied by the weight. And we have uh, the following lemma, which exactly shows uh, how this splitting works. So uh, we have a function distribution, and you see this is the space where it lives. So in B minus alpha in some negative space. And I wanted that the irregular part, so there's this one, this should now live in some even more negative space. And this is what we see here. Yeah. But I said I don't want to worry about the weight. So for instance, here I can take A equals 0. There wouldn't be any weight here. That means this irregular part really has to be nicely behaved at infinity. But still here I would have this delta, so here I have weight. And for the regular part, it works the other way around. So again, the same regularity of my distribution, and here I gain. So I gain, the regular part is smoother, but I need to somehow take into account the weight. Yeah, so this one actually needs a weight. If you think of B equal, B equal B uh, positive, for instance, then you see that you have some space to still preserve some positive weight here. Yeah, because your distribution F, it typically needs a weight. And then there are these coefficients, these constants here. So actually, the idea is that uh, if here you have something more regular than here, well, you gain. So given a positive constant L, you gain some small exponent. And it's the other way around here. So you have something more irregular, and you want something regular, you need to pay a price. That's why here you get 2 to L, so you need to pay some positive constant. Okay. And we will use this in our decomposition of the equations and in the a priori estimates. So let me show you how this works for the elliptic model in four dimensions. In five dimensions, it then becomes all much more complicated, much more messy. And uh, yeah, in the paper, we introduced some blue and magenta terms, which you actually cannot see that well if your printer is only black and white. But they look very nice on the screen. But let us stick to the four-dimensional case. So this is, again, the equation. And uh, you see this one additional term here. This is the renormalization. So somehow the picture you should keep in mind, it's more like we are on the epsilon level. So I have mollified my noise. There is some epsilon flying around, which I don't write. Uh, the solution depends on epsilon as well. It is smooth at this point. But as I remove this mollification, some terms would diverge. Uh, so there would be also this constant A. This is the renormalization constant, which depends on epsilon, and it diverges. OK. And so we use uh, the usual ansatz, which is the famous de Prato de Bush trick I learned. Um, so we want to cancel the most irregular part of the equation. And of course, that's the noise here. Yeah, so even though we think somehow of the smooth situation right now, I can only use bounds of the space white noise. And so the usual way to do that is I postulate that my solution has the following structure. There is x, and there is another phi, and there is psi. Now x solves a very similar equation, but I drop the nonlinearity. 
So now this is easier, I don't have any problem and I can solve this equation and I obtain x. Okay. And so, well, at the moment it's not quite clear why this actually helps, because I used to have one unknown and now I have two. So what is the gain? Well, I use this formula in my equation here. And the point is that uh, from this equation you see that the noise cancels. <coughs> so I already got rid of something of some bad term. So here I am left with the operator applied to phi, the operator applied to psi, and then from the cubic term I have to develop this cube. And so if everything was smooth I would just have their x cube, but now things are not expected to be smooth. So what I have here is the renormalized cube. And then we have three times uh, the linear term times um, the renormalized square. Then we have this one and that. So that's what you would do usually, but now we have to work a bit more because of the renormalization. And now the idea is to split this equation into two. Yeah. And you would like to have one equation for phi, one equation for psi, and the point is that one of them should be irregular and the other one would be regular. And now, well, you can guess. It's not so difficult to guess. Somehow here you see this, it's a linear kind of looking equation. So this should be the irregular one. And here I put the, uh, the cube because I really need it. It will help me in the end but this should be a classical solution. So this should be the regular part. Yeah. And now we should decide uh, what term goes where. Right. Also what you should observe at this point is that uh, it, it will be really a coupled system of equations. Uh -huh. Because well, I could somehow split them here, well not really here, but then it wouldn't be good because I wouldn't have one regular and the other one irregular. So I have to do something different. Uh, and so let me tell you what I do, for instance, for this product. So it is a product and I use the paracontrolled calculus. That means I decompose it in these three terms. So there is one paraproduct, the other paraproduct, and there is the resonant term. Okay, and now I'm actually seeking what is the irregular part, right? And so of course, um, x square, this would be a distribution. So this is the bad term, yeah? this is the irregular one. No. But I take one step further and I make it even more irregular using my localizers. Namely, I take this term and I split it in two and I use these localizers here. I apply them to my square and here I have the remaining term. Okay, and so now I can finally uh, do the splitting into regular and irregular part. Namely, into capital phi, I put the cube, that's a distribution, and from all these terms, I only include them th there this one. This is really the most irregular part, and that's the only thing that I put into capital phi. Yeah, and then I do the same for, for the linear term, linear in x, yeah, and all the rest, goes into capital Psi. So I have these guys and from what we saw here, I have these terms. So this is the, the other paraproduct and the resonant term all together. Okay, and now when you think about it, somehow the idea is, well, this equation is irregular, but it is linear, almost. No, it's not really linear. Um, but they are, they are the localizers. <laughs> what I mean is we can kind of use linear methods for this equation. Uh, and uh, so there are these localizers. Yeah, and we will see in the estimates, they somehow help us to decouple these equations. So that in the end, we don't have to work with this as if it was a system, but it allows us to first estimate phi and then use this estimate in order to estimate psi. So really to decouple them. Um, so how does that work? The first estimate that we prove is the one for phi. This is to be a function in B alpha for some alpha positive. You should think of alpha small. Um, okay, I have already told you that the stochastic objects are distributions. In particular, it can be shown that they all live in this space, in this space 
So kappa is again positive, small, and they need some weight. You remember that rho was a polynomial weight which decays at infinity. That's why I need here a constant which is positive. Okay, and so I plan to estimate this uh, function phi in B alpha. And for that I have the Schauder estimates. In other words, I need to estimate the right hand side in alpha minus two. And now if you think about it, so I have, uh, for instance, this term. So this is a para product. And estimate of this would depend on the L infinity norm of phi plus psi. Okay, then I have the localizer here. And you remember the little lemma that I showed you. We said for the irregular part, I can actually gain some small constant. So somehow giving, given this constant L, I get something small from this estimate. And this L gives me some additional freedom which I can use here. Namely, I choose L such that this holds true. And as a consequence, in the estimate of this para product, there would be L infinity nor coming from here, but this would precisely be compensated by the bound of this. So in the end, this term is estimated by one or actually by a constant which depends on the stochastic data. But it does not depend on the solutions. And that's very nice, right? Because, well, suddenly, it's not that I estimate phi in terms of phi and psi, but I really estimate it in terms of the stochastic data. And once I have this estimate, I immediately obtain my bound for the solution phi. And this is very good because now I continue with the equation for psi, but I already have my bound for phi, and therefore I can just use it. So let me show you how it goes next. I said that phi, uh, psi should be smooth. So it, it should really be a classical solution. Namely, we expect it in B2 plus beta and L infinity. And you should also observe the weights. They're kind of not random here. Yeah, in L infinity, we kind of decided we want to have their weight rho, and everything else is somehow given by some interpolation and argument so that things are consistent. But the rule of thumb is if you want more regularity, you need more weights. Okay, and so psi is a classical solution, and in that equation, there was the cube. So what kind of estimates can we have? Well, we still have Schauder estimates. This is the first bound here. So here 2 plus beta, here only beta, and the weight remains. But there is also the cubic term, which somehow doesn't help for the Schauder estimate. So this is what comes out of the cubic term. And then you see I still need to estimate the L infinity norm here. And for that we have a pointwise maximum principle. So really, really like pointwise evaluation when first derivatives cancel and second derivatives have, have a sign and we obtain such a bound. And here you see one over three, this is coming from the cubic term. And the cubic term also allows you to have here weight rho and here rho to the power cube. So this is somehow what helps you compensate this loss of weight. Because whenever you multiply a product by a weight and each of them needs a weight, well, there is a loss. And this somehow allows you to compensate for this loss. Okay, so we work now with this equation for psi. Uh, first, we get the Schauder estimates based on this lemma. We estimate also uh, the right-hand side. And then the coercive estimate, so the maximum principle, gives us such a bound. Yeah, and the g gain is that here the power is one minus something, a small constant, and therefore I can use the Young inequality in order to bound the L infinity norm. And then I use this bound here and therefore I also have a bound for this two plus beta norm. Okay, and so these are the a priori estimates. And when we arrived here, we were happy because that's what you would think, right? Uh, you have a priori estimate, so you have everything. But somehow it turns out that elliptic equations are still somehow a bit more tricky. Um, so it was then not so clear how to proceed. Somehow the natural thing that you maybe would like to do and that we wanted to do was to modify the noise, use the estimates and pass to the limit. But there is this point that for elliptic equations you need a positive mass. 
If you renormalize, you include an infinite constant and your mass becomes very negative. So that's not a good approach and therefore we chose a different approach, which is the following. We first solve the equations on a large torus. And this relies on the Schaeffer fixed point theorem. This is a topological fixed point theorem in the spirit of Schauder fixed point. So it gives you existence, it doesn't give you uniqueness. And we want to apply this fixed point theorem to the following map, which is defined as follows. So K gets phi tilde, psi tilde, and it gives you a solution to this system. So you see what happened, I just froze the coefficient here and I froze the coefficient here. I didn't freeze the cube because this is what gives me all the estimates. This is what I really need. Yeah. And so the first question you ask yourself is whether this map is well defined. So whether actually a solution exists. Um, so for the first equation, well this exists because we have the Schauder estimates. But you see in the second one, due to this term, there is really an equation to solve. And so I find this kind of cute, this argument, but it's like we use many methods here. And one of them is we need to solve this equation. And for that, we use the variational approach. So we construct an energy functional, we prove that it is convex and all that, and therefore we get existence of a unique solution to this equation. And then we prove that it's a smooth solution, etc. And this guarantees uh, the fact that this mapping is well defined. And then we use our a priori estimates to prove that there is certain compactness in order to apply the Schaeffer's fixed point. So then this theorem, this topological fixed point, gives us an existence of a solution on the large torus. And then we use our a priori estimates again in order to pass to the limit with the size of the torus. And we have solutions on the full space. Okay, so this was for the elliptic. Do I still have some time? Yes, some. Some? <laughs> <laughs> How much? I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Okay. So let me tell you also a little bit about the parabolic. So as I said, originally we wanted to solve the elliptic equations, but then we realized somehow the same decomposition, the same estimates are also useful here. Um, so for existence, we worried only about regular initial conditions. And this is really somehow the same decomposition what you already saw, and there are only minor modification. So in particular, we work with space-time polynomial weights because we want to be really on the zero infinity in time. And we also, as a consequence, need to modify our localizers. Yeah, because you remember these localizers were done in such a way that they also played with the weights. And there was some partition of unity. But now the weights also depend on time. Therefore, we also need to trace the behavior of the weight in time. And therefore, we introduce an additional partition of unity in time. Yeah, and we kind of uh, modify slightly these localizers. And we also modify, OK, I didn't tell you about paracontrolled ansatz. But anyway, that concerns only the three-dimensional case. So here we need a uh, modified para product, actually. But let me not get into details here. There. Um, so for the existence, I think we could also do something similar as in the elliptic situation using some topological fixed point. But actually here this somehow nicer and easier method that you just modify the noise and pass to the limit, here it works. Uh, because you don't have a problem if the mass becomes negative or something like that. So we really, we modify the noise. Uh, and this equation is then solved using classical theory. And we work right away on the full space. So this is solved by the classical theory. Then we do exactly the same decomposition and the same a priori estimates. And we pass to the limit using these a priori estimates. So we use compactness in order to pass to the limit. So this is what concerns existence. And then uniqueness, again, becomes somewhat more tricky. Because for uniqueness, the cubic term doesn't help you anymore. Now, if you write down the equation for the difference of two solutions, well, you get one term which, is, which kind of has a good sign, but doesn't really help you. So somehow this 
phenomenon where we were able to gain the weights using the cubic term, it doesn't seem to appear here. And so we need something else, some different mechanism which would compensate for the loss of, uh, loss of weight in products. And what we did, uh, we used such a space-time exponential way. And actually, we wanted to take advantage of these L infinity bounds that we have. And this is very nice because then for uniqueness, you could work in L2. So actually, we use really like basic L2 energy estimates in such uh, L2 scale Bessel spaces. So how you would actually do that? It's like you have your equation and then you apply Ito formula or whatever chain rule you have for this norm. But now the important fact is that the weight pi depends also on time. So at some point you would see the time derivative of this weight. And this is how it looks like. And the point of this definition is that you see it gives you a good term. It goes to the left. And in addition, this weight, so this is the polynomial weight, but now the constant b is positive. So it's a weight which increases at infinity. And this is very strong because you have it suddenly on the left of your equation. And you can use that in order to absorb terms from the right. And this is precisely what we do. So we split the equation again in a regular and irregular component. For the regular, we apply the chain rule to this norm. And in addition, from the gradient term, we get one more derivative here. Yeah, and for the irregular, then we apply Ito or chain rule to this norm. And again, from the gradient bound, we get this term. So here we would be really in a space of positive regularity if beta is small. Yeah, and in the end, there is a Gronwall argument which allows you to absorb the remaining term from the right hand side. Okay, and there is still the coming down from infinity, and for that we introduce the following weight. So this is a weight which vanishes at zero. At zero it behaves like t, but it remains bounded. Now we didn't have, we, we didn't want to worry with having t at infinity, but so we chose this weight. The problem with this is that it really vanishes at zero, so it's not a good way how to somehow define weighted spaces, for instance. Um, and therefore, we needed to get some new Schauder estimates and new coercive estimates, which are really adapted to this weight, which vanishes at zero. Then there is, again, another modified paracontrolled ansatz. And then we still repeat kind of our estimates. Here, there are some modifications needed, but still one could do that, and we obtain estimates of this form. So this is for the three-dimensional situation. And you see there is always this weight. Somehow uh, it is tau to one half corresponds to rho, and then we have different powers here. And these estimates are uniform in the initial condition. Yeah, the point is somehow that if you work with this weight, it vanishes at zero, so you don't see your initial condition. And therefore the estimates become really uniform in the initial condition. And with that, I would like to thank you for attention. Okay, thanks a lot. So, are there questions? Uh, just actually short about the weight. Sorry, just about the weight that you use at the end. This uh, this one minus e to the minus t that of course only behaves like t near zero, whereas we have this square root of t. Can you kind of get the right? Um, yeah, sorry, that's why there is square root. <laughs> so about the uniqueness for the elliptic uh, problem, do you think it's not true? Do you have some ideas? I mean. So probably I wouldn't expect it for every mass, but somehow for a large mass, at least maybe on a large set of omegas, I would expect it should be unique. But, but yeah, it's and are there some results known maybe in lower dimension or in simpler cases? So I'm not available of any results for such single, yeah, I don't know. Somehow in uniqueness, here we really use this point and it really gives us a very good term on the left, which we use to absorb. And in, yeah, this is really a parabolic argument. Since then, we thank Martina again.